Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Sears Q3 webinar. My name is Joe Euler from Data Sears Customer Success Team, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. On behalf of both the Data Seer and Data Mirror teams, we thank you for joining us, and we look forward to sharing our insights and findings on the intersection of AI tools and asset data integrity. As I, as I expose today's agenda, before diving into the panelists' introductions, I'd like to point out a few relevant resources regarding today's webinar. First, today's session will be recorded and shared at the conclusion of today's call. Secondly, we will dedicate a session of today's call to user-submitted questions. You will find a question answer function in the bottom of the Zoom webinar app. Please submit any questions you have and upvote submitted questions that are relevant to you. We'll prioritize the most upvoted questions upon reaching the Q&A session. Now, allow me to introduce today's panelists. First, representing Datasphere, allow me to introduce Joanne Ting. Joanne is the CEO and president of Datasphere. She has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from the University of Waterloo with a PhD in Computer Science from the University of Southern California. She has been working in machine learning since 2003 in robotics, control, manufacturing, automotive, risk management, and industrial application domains. And joining us today from Data Mirror Solutions, we have project manager Adam Weiss. Adam leads the data management team at Data Mirror Solutions, responsible for data curation and developing new data standards for data consulting. With a background in mechanical engineering, Adam has excelled in data management for large-scale facilities and maintenance projects within the world's leading pharmaceutical companies. Adam has been an integral part of emerging engineering knowledge with data science, problem solving, and account management within the big data industry. Before handing it off to our panelists, I'd like to seed our audience with a brief overview in asset data integrity. Asset data integrity refers to the state of accuracy, consistency, and reliability of data associated with the organization's physical assets, such as equipment, machinery, infrastructure, and facilities. It involves ensuring the information related to these assets is correct, up-to-date and trustworthy, so it can be effectively used for decision-making, compliance, maintenance, and other critical operational processes. Ensuring an organization's data has or meets a st standard of data integrity would indicate competency in the following areas. Completeness, having sufficient volume of data from which to benchmark and model metrics. Additionally, being able to readily reach this information in accessible business intelligence app applications that properly contextualize this data. Security, Making data more readily accessible within an organization will require deployment of robust cybersecurity measures to ensure the sensitive data remains secured. Additionally, the organization's data storage and infrastructure must meet data privacy requirements set by compliance standards such as GDPR or HIPAA. Consistency. An organization, as an organization acquires or builds out assets, the legacy data to be imported or new data to be created needs to be cleansed to meet internal data standards and formats. Accuracy. Ensuring the data collected is accurate is paramount for the effectiveness of the business. Inaccuracies can range from inconsistencies in the digital footprint of a facility to faulty time series data on a measurement device. Organizations are challenged with deployment of comprehensive collection techniques to meet the required data fidelity. Driving the need for immediate access to reliable high fidelity data is the adoption of industry 4.0 technology and methods across asset holding sectors, the rate of which continues to accelerate year over year. A survey conducted among business leaders by Hamburg-based IoT Analytics revealed in 2015, 88% of business leaders did not understand the underlying business models or implications of the Internet of Things for industry. Where later surveys in 2019 showed 25% of participants had implemented or rolled out such solutions, the number which has grown to 72% when conducted in 2022. Adoption of 4.0 architectures and solutions is projected to continue to grow into the near future. Analysts have, analysts have valued this market at $113.4 billion in 2021 and project the valuation to grow to $618 billion by 2013, representing a compounding annual growth rate of 18.8% over that period. To meet the intrinsic challenges that come with achieving and maintaining asset data, organizations are implementing strategies leveraging a combination of policy, technology, and professional services to unlock the benefits operating with high fidelity information. Such solutions include data governance, which is a set of practices and policies that organizations establish and implement to ensure high fidelity, high data quality, data management consistency, data security, and compliance with relevant regulations and policies. It, encompass it, it encompasses the processes and rules for collecting, storing, managing, and using data throughout the organization. 
data governance aims to make data more accessible, reliable, and valuable while mitigating the risks associated with data management. Data integration, which refers to the centralization of data among the different sources as, it, and as organization begins to collect and coalesce different types of information across its facilities. Creating a robust infrastructure that can both quickly collect, reconcile, and inform and user systems such as asset integrity ma maintenance or asset performance management systems while upholding the standards set by the aforementioned data governance ensures that efficient decisions can be made in a timely manner. Master data services, by leveraging third-party teams to bring subject matter oversight to the cleaning, formatting, and reconciliation of asset data to align with internal standards, further than leveraging industry knowledge to help derive value and information from which the data can be utilized, drive automated processes, and inform strategic decisions. Data visualization, which not only helps to inform decision makers with easy to interpret dashboards and records to track asset performance, also allows teams to help optimize asset performance in earlier stages of builds by interpreting process plans in three-dimensional spaces. And then finally, artificial in intelligence and machine learning. While I'll leave a larger explanation of this to today's panelists, I just want to make note to today's attendees, deployment of these prior solutions and the enterprise scale is achieved and, and implemented through using processes of both AI and ML methods. With the investment of the aforementioned solutions, asset-driven companies are then gleaning the benefits in the form of the following. Improved decision-making by closing the distance between your decision-makers and real-time accurate data, such as asset performance, maintenance schedules, and other KPIs, organizations have make, can make informed decisions regarding asset investments, upgrades, and replacements, which helps optimize resource allocations, planning, and increase profitability and efficiency. One such example of that would be by centralizing and comparing their asset data, organizations can identify underutilized assets for better use. Additionally, they can deploy strategic predictive maintenance and reduce maintenance costs. Increase safety by Identifying under-maintained assets, organizations can intervene with upgrades, plant maintenance, and other programs or policies to protect their operational teams. Longer asset lifespans. Organizations can maintain their assets in optimal condition, reducing the frequency of breakdowns and extending the lifespan of their assets. This reduces the need for asset replacement and repairs, resulting in cost savings and improved profitability. And finally, better regulatory compliance. By tracking the lineage, businesses are able to identify where data originated, how it is processed, and who has access to it, which facilitates compliance efforts and reduces the risks of pen penalties associated with data privacy compliance standards. With that, I'll pass the floor to our guest panelist, Adam Weiss, who will be discussing how we use data in our organizations and its impact on decision-making. Adam? Thank you for the introduction, Joe. Um, as Joe highlighted, the decision-making that we deal with every single day affects the impact of our work um, in our organizations. Big and small, we make thousands of decisions every single day. Some estimates um, saying it's as high as 35,000 every day. While we tend to recall only the large decisions, we tend to ignore the countless small decisions that we make daily. What I hope to explore in this webinar is how intelligent data design improves our decision making at the macro scale and how leveraging those same design principles um, will also impact the small decisions we make subconsciously every day. Organizations in this information age put a premium on data-driven decision-making, but oftentimes they're lacking in two main areas. They may struggle with data deficiency, missing out on key insights that data could be providing them with. Additionally, they may struggle with data apathy. They gather data that is unnecessary, distracting, and neglected. From the data gathering and curation process, all the way to the data-driven decisions that they lead to, Organizations everywhere are failing to use data-driven decisions um, that come from thoughtful data design and capture. Oftentimes, we use the words data and information interchangeably. They're not exactly the same thing. While data resides in our world as unorganized facts, it can take many forms. It can be specific words we read, observations we make, numbers we interact with, or symbols that we see. In this context, we are surrounded by unimaginable amounts of data every single day fighting for both our conscious and subconscious attention. And from this vast amount of data, we can extract information by processing and organizing it. It's this information that allows us to bypass the distractions in the ocean of data. And because of this, it's essential that we consider what data we choose to collect. This is going to limit the knowledge 
insights, and ultimately the wisdom that we can attain from it. And because data is everywhere and it's so foundational to us, it's crucial we consider some fundamental questions when it comes to data science. The questions are, what data do we need and what data can we trust? We can ask ourselves some questions when we think about what data we want to capture. Questions like, what am I trying to accomplish and how will data get me there? We need to think about the goals within our organizations and if those goals are gonna need data to support them, what data is that gonna be? We also need to consider time horizons for using this data. What can we use it for immediately and what benefits can we get from it in the long term? We may have high optimistic goals such as lowering our unacceptably high asset and system downtime. But this requires us to consider not only what data will allow us to measure the size of these problems and also our progress towards solving them. Secondly, we can ask what data will future me and current me for gathering today? Whenever we find ourselves wishing we had data to support a big decision, it's usually because we didn't have time to capture it. The questions like, how much money and labor have I spent repairing this old asset? Or how has an asset's energy consumption increased over time? Both of these questions are going to need a history of data if we want to measure the changes. Because of this, data we capture will build in usefulness over time, and future us will thank present us for considering their needs. And thirdly, we can think about process, think about what processes can be changed to create more informed data. We start by looking at what archaic processes do we currently have in place? Things like asset introduction processes that don't work for our organizations. If we can change those to get the right information and the right systems every time, our organizations will benefit greatly. We also can automate data collection at times, as well as using existing software tools, or maybe even designing our own software tools to augment any of these data processes. Processes like these will help our organizations overcome their hesitations to actually use their own data and get the advantages of data-driven decision-making. Um, as a precursor to maybe discussing some of the details of data's impact on decision-making, I want to explain a smidge of psychology using the systems of thinking concept popularized in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And in short, our brain can think in two ways. System one thinking, where we automatically and passively make decisions and process thoughts. A common example of this would be when we drive a car, our actions that we take from within the car, as well as our assessment of the road conditions and traffic all around us, all of which occur without conscious thought. We use system one whenever we do any sort of mindless activity, like updating our massive list of Excel spreadsheets or anything else like that. System two is active. It's usually what we associate with the classic sense of decision-making as well as focused attention. System two can be involved in deciding on a maintenance strategy for an asset or something even more complex, like fine tuning a capital reinvestment plan where we can remove bad actors that negatively affect our plant efficiencies. While system one makes up the bulk of our daily decision, system two is going to make up the significant and impactful decisions that we make. Uh, but with these systems to think in mind, we can ask ourselves, does the data we curate serve just system one or system two, or can it be used to serve both? These systems of thinking are very useful in understanding a big challenge in our industry of getting reliable asset information. Our system one thinking is always working over time whenever we're seeing and processing data. And this happens so quickly and seamlessly that it leads people to trust whatever data that is they see. This can hinder our operations and maintenance teams whenever they are provided with untrustworthy data or they're not provided with any data and are missing some key insights from it. So when we capture, organize, and ultimately present data, our goal is to be able to provide accurate context as quickly as our vision can process it. So when we look at databases, physical assets, and drawings, we know that as viewers, we can interpret the information within a matter of seconds. And we should leverage those benefits when we design data structures, combining these types of data in a single portal where people can easily understand their data and gather information effortlessly. Additionally, in tackling asset data deficiency issues, we often need to capture data from a variety of locations like those I just mentioned. We must also maintain data integrity during the entire capture process. We actually use DataSeer software to help us with um, part of this process in capturing data from within drawings. Before we had their software, I used to do this all the time by myself, and it's an extremely time costly activity without the help of OCR technology. So now instead of copying or transcribing text data, we use software tools like DataSeer to help us scan drawings and isolate useful text in a more useful manner such as a table. And like I said with systems, the mental burden on system one when you have to do things repetitively is brutal 
And this definitely reduces that burden and uh, gets our uh, data a lot easier. Now that I have explained some considerations for selecting data for capture, we should probably talk about four uses of data because if we talk about these ultimate uses for our data, we will both fine tune our data selectivity and we'll also maximize the utility of the data. These uses also build upon one another as they grow in complexity. And we're gonna start with at the lowest level of complexity, the goal of making data available. In defining availability, we need to consider the most important elements. Is our data hard to access, whether that's due to IT constraints, or old software, or another technical limitation? If we are able to remove these roadblocks and provide easy access, we can help remove the ignorance within our organizations and the apathy that comes alongside um, with regards to our data. Additionally, we know that information can live in a variety of spots. It can live in a CMMS system like SAP. It can also live in documentation, drawings, Excel spreadsheets, anywhere. But even if we can get this data, it's usually very, very, very time consuming to aggregate it. Our error-prone system one thinking gets involved whenever we have to do repetitive tasks, we're looking to do numerous drawings or documents. Because of this, when we centralize information, it will increase the efficiency of our workforce by minimizing the uh, efforts they have to spend gathering data. And lastly, if coding knowledge or some sort of certain training is needed to get information, we have to make efforts to remove these barriers so that the information can get to those who need it regardless of technical training. So if we are thoughtful in availability focused data design, information will be accessed quickly and precisely from within our organizations. At the next complexity level, we have relations and correlations between data. Both data relations and correlations reveal what data points have in common. Relating data allows us to establish connections that we may know intuitively, but we don't always know at scale. And while this knowledge may be known by certain subject matter experts, well-designed databases can make it available for their entire teams or even other departments. Additionally, data correlation provides knowledge about data interaction and is useful in exploring any sort of possible trend within data. And while correlations may provide us with a preliminary look at an asset's energy use over time, we know that we're going to need more than a single chart if we want to fully understand the factors that impact energy use. And recalling that correlation does not equal causation, classic, when we are looking at asset performance data, where do we need to make the necessary connections if we want to do robust analysis on something like asset performance? We need to link the right data sources and structure our databases, because both of which are crucial, but it's really through analysis where we truly empower great decision making. Here in analysis, the third use, we combine our available, related, and correlated data. We analyze data using a variety of methods, one of which descriptive methods or rolling up data, where we take data from the micro level and we use it to understand the macro level. This can be things like comparing the effects of certain maintenance strategies on a given asset class of performance. We also can complete diagnostic analysis. This is kind of the opposite where we drill down, taking knowledge of the macro and we use it to uh, apply it to the macro or the micro. These um, efforts could be things like root cause analysis or certain maintenance efforts like vibration or infrared analysis. Thirdly, we have predictive analysis where we use machine learning and AI models to project forward trends and find patterns within data that are hidden from the human eye. Using predictive analysis, we can create models for estimating things like maintenance costs or even go further and predict failure of our aging equipment. Lastly, prescriptive analysis is where we make suggestions and automate decision-making, which will segue us into the last use of data, decision-making. Built upon the last three uses, decision-making is the final and most impactful use of data. Because of this, it often comes alongside the most scrutiny and deliberation. We often think of decisions as being made by humans exclusively, but depending on complexity, rule-based decisions and automation are often often very feasible and potentially more useful. We also want to monitor confidence in our data-driven decisions. We know that even if we had the most ideal data, we still need to be realistic with our upper limits of confidence in any decision we make. And following any decision, intelligent data design will help us verify the decision's effectiveness and also validate its proper execution. So to summarize, let's review the key takeaways. First, we must establish a goal for creating capturing and using data. We should be creative and explorative with potential uses of data, 
but we know that we cannot capture everything and expect not to drown in an ocean of death. Secondly, we must consider the needs of our future selves. A great way to ensure this is to brainstorm about the future with a diverse group with different insights and motivations. When you bring a team like this together, you'll be able to be proactive with data capture and analysis to the benefit of all of your teams and even your entire organizations. And thirdly, you must understand the impact of capturing and maintaining data. You need to ask whether these processes will be a burden on our workforce or a time saver, and specifically whether time effort spent upfront will save us time in the long run. And then lastly, we must design our data in a way that supports the before and after of our decisions. We can only refine our decision-making skills if we measure the success um, of previous ones, measure the success and failure of previous ones, and use that knowledge to help our decision-making in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, if you'd like to learn anything else about Datamara and how we help our clients with a variety of asset and facilities data problems, reach out to us on LinkedIn or on our website, datamara.com. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Joe and Joanne, who have some more great stuff for you guys. And I hope to hear from any or all of you in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. And with that, I'll pass it over to Joanne Ting. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. My name is Joanne Ting, and I'm here to introduce and describe challenges with industrial asset data and how AI, ML tools, and techniques can help. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, in the last 10, 10 to 20 years, much has been made about this data deluge phenomenon that, that frankly came about as a result of the internet and then technology breakthroughs. Here are some magazine covers from The Economist. One on the left is from 2010 about this data deluge phenomenon. And then the other is from 2017, more recently, about how the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. So the question is, how do we make decisions based on massive amounts of data? This is a process, as Adam outlined, where you start from um, determining what data to collect, track, monitor, and um, trying to figure out how visualizations can help with this process. Um, humans are visual creatures, and so visualizations may help us determine which features are rele relevant, what groups of data are correlated, and what um, new features should be generated. By the way, features, in case anyone wants to know, sorry, Joe, I'm not ready yet. Uh, in case anyone wants to know, these can mean a raw input, a sensor stream input, um, or an input that is generated from combinations or transformations of existing data. And then finally, the, my last bullet point, how do you go from model predictions or analytical insights to actions that need to be taken such that you get different outcomes? And Adam touched on this a bit in his section where he outlined the differences between the types of analytics. So going from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive, and then finally prescriptive or automated decision-making. Um, so let's now deep dive into techniques that you may find useful, depending on the type of industrial asset data you're dealing with. Now, I've tried to organize them into categories based on which stage of the decision-making process you're at, but please keep in mind this is not a complete or comprehensive list. I've also tried to indicate what type of data a technique is applicable for. So first, as part of data collection, tracking, and monitoring, you may find yourself with time series IoT data that contains outliers. So you may want to do outlier or anomaly detection, or perhaps you've noticed some missing or dropped data in your census streams, in which case you may need to impute missing data. Um, in case you have high dimensional data, with many features, you may want to cluster them to see if there are groups of correlated features so that you can remove redundancy and focus on key relevant ones. And this leads into visualizations and representations. So you can ensure you're focusing and capturing um, important relationships. So techniques like dimensionality reduction, so for example, principal com components analysis, also known as PCA, if you want to do exploratory analysis, that's a great technique, or LDA, also known as linear discriminant analysis, in case you want to do classification and factor in the class labels, um, and feature selection allow you to do this. If you're dealing with text data, which in the industrial space you do in the form of logs, reports, this is where incidents are typically captured and documented. 
then word and sentence embeddings are useful to represent information contained in text documents. And then finally, as part of getting to actions and tying observations to outcomes, you may need to summarize text in a document, um, recognize or classify objects in an image or drawing, or forecast pr or predict an output in a time series data stream. So I should note many of these techniques are now widely accessible as open source libraries or macros or functions. Um, so you don't have to implement these yourself from scratch anymore. Now, one thing to be careful of, next slide please, that Adam uh, mentioned is that correlation does not imply causation. So here's a little uh, comic from XKCD that's making a joke out of this. So by plotting, for example, the incidence rates of cancer um, on top of adoption of cell phones in the last 50 years, one could conclude that cell phones cause cancer, or if we wanted to be facetious, that cancer causes cell phones. So this is actually most obvious to engineers in the process of doing a root cause analysis, correlations are quickly separated from causal effects. Um, before I move on to my next slide, I wanted to share some references on causal inference uh, for any curious readers who'd like to learn more. Next slide, please. Um, and so here are two references. Um, Judea Pearl is a professor of computer science and engineering at UCLA and also winner of the Turing Award in 2011. His book, Causality, originally published in 2000, is the definitive guide to causal inference and analysis and a more digestible version that's accessible to the lay person and requires less statistical, book, statistical background uh, was published in 2018 called The Book of Why. Um, and then to, on to my last slide. Um, here's a final slide to summarize pros and cons of AI, ML, and statistical analysis. Um, as you can see, advantages include consistency, right? Computer-based algorithms and models do not get tired, distracted, need breaks, and they can stay objective. Well, this is also a disadvantage, but I'll get to that later. Um, second point, pattern detection and recognition can be easily done in large high-dimensional data sets. And then also performance is fast and scalable from a computational point of view. For cloud-based computing, spinning up more computer nodes in the cloud to get more processing power is easy and can be automated. Now, in terms of disadvantages, note that historical training data needs to show all patterns and behaviors that can happen in order to predict or analyze them. This is not fortune telling, and so predicting something that has never occurred before is not possible. The other thing too is that computers don't get tired, but they also cannot leverage human hands-on experience. So say you have 30, 35, 40 years of domain experience. Um, you cannot actually capture that unless, of course, it's already captured in data observations or math mathematical modeling, right? And then finally, to kind of derive from this human element, um, a human is still needed to, make, to intervene and, and make a final decision and, and take a final action. So in parting, I have some thoughts to leave you with in my next slide. Um, so first of all, in terms of AI for plant management activities, the question is where are we in this data to, to decision-making process? Are we still stuck in the data collection and organization phase? Are we still stuck trying to sift through and make sense of what to collect and how to organize it? It's a big question. Um, and then the second point is true scalability of AI, ML, and statistical techniques really in production environments requires large amounts of data to avoid sort of the handcrafting and cherry picking of models and algorithms every time. Say it's a new production train, new facility, new site. This is not yet the case today as observed by many stories I've heard about too many POCs and pilots that are failing in production. So clearly we're not quite there yet. Now, one last point to kind of drive home. A data-driven approach should be a help, not a hindrance to existing processes because this is really meant to accelerate decision-making. But oftentimes, 
we've noticed. Too many people freeze in the presence of too much data or try to hide behind numbers. So that's just a, a one last point to remind everybody, decisions should be supported by numbers and not to not be a slave to numbers. Um, Cause there's also a factor of the human factor of intuition and experience.